Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today, 1 Samuel chapter 29, verse 1. We're going to wrap up 1 Samuel in the next two lectures here at the chapel. And I hope you're enjoying it as much as we're enjoying bringing it to you. We're having a blessed day here at the chapel. We hope you're being blessed where you are. In our last lecture, we saw... Uh, Saul going to the witch or, or summonsing up the witch of Ender to try and contact the spirit of Samuel. Uh, Saul was desperate. Uh, he inquired of the Lord. The Lord didn't answer. He knew that the spirit of God was gone from him and the spirit of God was with David. And, but uh, that's a new low even for Saul well, consulting a familiar spirit. It's written of in the Chronicles that that was one of the reasons that uh, God uh, had Saul uh, taken out, if you will, in, in the war with the Philistines. And that war is just on the horizon as we pick it up in chapter 29, verse 1. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. 1 Samuel chapter 29, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek. Aphek means strength, if you translate it. And the Israelites pitched by a fountain which is in Jezreel. Now Jezreel, this is no doubt uh, what's known as Goliath's fountain. And it's ironic uh, that the location is the place where Goliath was killed. And the Philistines suffered a tremendous uh, loss to the armies of Israel. Well, there's going to be another war in this vicinity. Uh, this time the Philistines thump Israel's gourd and Saul and uh, two or three of his sons lose their life uh, in the battle, verse 2. And the lords of the Philistines passed on by hundreds and by thousands, this means they were arranged in companies of hundreds and thousands. They, they were thick, there was a bunch of them. But David and his men passed on in the rearward with Achish. Now, you see at this point in time, David is living in Ziklag, which originally was allotted to the tribe of Simeon, but had been lost to the Philistines. Uh, David showed up with his 600 men, their families, and their livestock in Gath, where Achish was the king, and asked, don't, don't let us be underfoot here in your way. Give us a city. And Achish assigned Ziklag to David. Um, David, from that point, was launching attacks against the friends and allies of the Philistines. And when Achish would ask him, where did you go and raid? I see you got all this spoil here, that you, the spoils of war. Where did you go? And David would say, well, we went into the south of Judah and we took from the Kenites and da-da-da-da-da-da, when in fact he was doing it to the allies and friends of the Philistines. Had Achish known that David was doing that, he probably would have killed him or at least run him off, taken him to the border of Judah and said, don't come back. So, but at this point, Achish is, is trusting David. Uh, David has proved himself, or at least in cover, he has told Achish what he was doing. And, but uh, again, Achish is trusting him, but it's a false trust. Uh, Achish is planning on using David's knowledge of Saul's military tactics against Saul. Verse 3. Then said the princes of the Philistines. Now these were, you see there are five major provinces or regions of the Philistines. 
Uh, Achish is just one of them. There are four others. What do these Hebrews hear? Question. And Achish said unto the princes of the Philistines, Is not this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me these days and these years? And I have found no fault in him since he fell unto me unto this day. In other words, since he fell away from his previous master, Saul. But uh, he defeated the champion of Gath, Goliath. Now David is my champion. I trust him, and, and you, you know, the other four kings of the Philistines, should trust him as well. They're not going to, verse 4. And the princes, the four other kings of the Philistines, were wroth with him. They were mad and angry at Achish. And the princes of the Philistines said unto him, Make this fellow return, that he may go again to his place, which thou hast appointed him. Make him go back to Ziklag, and let him not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he be an adversary to us. For wherewith should we, he reconcile himself unto his master, referring to Saul, should it not be with the heads of these uh, men, uh, our own men's heads, is how David is going to reconcile with his previous master, Saul. We don't trust him. Uh, he's going to be, David and his men are going to be fighting right along beside us, and then there he's going to turn and change his mind and start fighting with Saul and kill us. And this is God working. It would not be, be befitting for uh, David, the future king of Israel, to be fighting and killing uh, his own future subjects. Verse 5, Is not this David, the other uh, five, four kings of the Philistines, uh, continue, of whom they sang one to another in dances, saying, Saul slew his thousands, and David his tens, of thousands. And of course, the tens of thousands were their brothers, their fathers, their uncles, their sons, their own people. And uh, they're saying, David is a dangerous man. At the time that they sang those songs that Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his tens of thousands, that was the first uh, inkling of Saul's jealousy. Saul heard the young ladies singing, Saul's killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And David's success, uh, that was that evil spirit and the jealousy that drove Saul mad. Verse 6, Then Achish called David and said unto him, Surely as the Lord liveth, that's as Yahweh liveth, thou hast been upright, and thy going out and thy coming in with me is the host, in the host, is good in my sight. This going out and coming in is, is a hip figure of speech, uh, and it means your, your day to day activities. For I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me unto this day. Nevertheless, the Lord's favor thee not, the other four kings of the Philistines, uh, they don't trust you. This, uh, you have coming out unto me, uh, to, unto me and to this day. You see, Achish doesn't know about the attacks that David made in chapter 27, verse 8, on his friends and allies and on the Amalekites. David told him, we're going into Judah and, and spoiling their land and bringing the spoils of war back home. Now this, as the Lord liveth, that's, that's a oath on Yahweh. But now this is in no way to be taken that Akish converted. Uh, this simply means that he's adding sincerity to his declaration to David. No one could be around David for very long without realizing that he was a very spiritual man, a very religious man. Verse 7, Achish continues to David, Wherefore now return and go in peace, 
that thou displease not the lords of the Philistines. Go back to Ziklag uh, with your men and fighting against uh, the people David would soon be the king of would not only be displeasing to the princes of the Philistines, it would be displeasing to uh, Yahweh as well. So God provided a way. David was between a rock and a hard place here. He was residing among the Philistines, basically uh, uh, hiding from Saul, if you will. And, but then when the Philistines invited him to go to war, uh, it was difficult for him to, to cover his, uh, the, the fact that he had been attacking not the people of Judah, but rather the allies and friends of Achish and the Philistines. Verse 8, And David said unto Achish, But what have I done? And what hast thou found in thy servant, so long as I have been with thee unto this day, that I may not go fight against the enemies of my lord the king? David's being a little ambiguous there. Did he say, that I could go and fight against the enemies of you, Achish? No, he said, the enemies of my lord, the king. He could be meaning Saul. Uh, he could mean Achish. Uh, again, he's being vague uh, at best. But David's laying it on thick here. Uh, he's acting like he's disappointed that he and his men are going to be excluded from the wars against Saul. Uh, inside, no doubt, he is rejoicing. And Achish answered and said to David, I know that thou art good in my sight. He bought David's ambiguous response. As an angel of God, notwithstanding <clears throat> the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us to the battle. The other four kings of the Philistines uh, don't trust you. Uh, they're refusing to allow you to go up in that battle, and it's four to one. Uh, I'm outvoted by the other four kings of the Philistines. Verse 10, Wherefore now rise up early in the morning with thy master's servants that are come with thee, and as soon as ye be up early in the morning and have light, depart. Get out of here uh, at first light. Now this master servants, that's in reference to his master, previous master was Saul. And it's written in First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 19 and 20, that there were some Manassites who became angry with Saul's rule and Saul's craziness uh, and lack of faith in God, I'll add. But the Manassites uh, came to David, and I think that's what's meant by uh, with thy master's servants. In other words, they are Israelites. The kings of the Philistines don't trust you or anyone of Israel, so take your men and go back to Ziklag. Verse 11, So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to return into the land of the Philistines back to uh, their current home at Ziklag. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. The war against Israel is imminent. Uh, Saul's days uh, on earth are growing very short. But that serves a purpose too in God's plan, which was for David to be the king of Israel. Saul had been rejected. He will die in the battle with the Philistines opening a path after there's somewhat of a power struggle uh, in the first part of 2 Samuel, but David eventually becomes the king. Now, uh, things are not going to be good at Ziklag when they arrive home. Chapter 30, verse 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day. It was a hard uh, ride, a hard march uh, from where they had joined at Jezreel with the Philistines to fight against Israel. That the Amalekites had invaded the south. This is the hill country of southern Judah. 
uh, including Ziklag. And Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire. Now this is David's current home. And remember, David left the women, the children, everything that they owned, their possessions at Ziklag unguarded. He took all 600 of his men to fight with Achish against Israel, or under the pretense that he was going to. Not smart to leave the home front unprotected. Verse 2, And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, meaning they didn't uh, kill any of the adults or the children but carried them away and went on their way. And no doubt intending to keep uh, their family members, the women and the children, uh, as servants or slaves, if you will. Uh, perhaps their intent, uh, since they didn't kill any of them, was to ransom them back uh, to David. I, I think, too, the reason the Amalekites were striking at Ziklag uh, back in chapter 27, verse 8, David and his men were uh, attacking Amalekites. So I think this probably, uh, what they did to Ziklag was to avenge David's attacks of chapter 27, verse 8. Although David left not one man, woman, or child, or even beast, uh, left alive in the cities that they attacked. Verse 3. So David and his men came to the city, Ziklag, and behold, it was burned with fire, no doubt, uh, smoke still rising from the ruins, the ashes. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. David paid a price for his mistake of not leaving some of his men to protect Ziklag, the home front. Verse 4. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no power to weep. It appeared that they had lost everything, including uh, their wives, including their sons and daughters to the Amalekites. Verse 5, And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelites, and Abigail the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. Now, you know, it, I, you see people that are on the news and a uh, disaster has struck, uh, a tornado, for example. And, I mean, the house is gone, the, the furniture is gone, everything is gone. But when they gather back together and no one of the family is missing, everyone is all right, they, they're happy. I mean, here they've lost everything, but still they're rejoicing because it could have been worse. You see, there are some things that just can't be replaced. Uh, a family member is one of those things that can't be replaced. Verse 6, And David was greatly distressed for the people, and his own people, spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved. This means in the Hebrew that uh, their souls were bitter, or probably uh, better, embittered. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. Some things just can't be replaced. But David encouraged or strengthened himself in the Lord his God. They were thinking or speaking of stoning David because of his error in not leaving some to protect the home front. Or perhaps they were th talking of stoning David because he wanted them to ally with Achish and fight against Israel to begin with. David's finally learning, though, that when the going gets tough, turn to the Lord. He, he wrote often in the book of Psalms, King David did, of how he learned to put his, his trust and his confidence and to take refuge in the Lord. You can take a lesson from David in that yourself. You elect in particular 
when the times get tough, when, the, when you, just, you just don't think you can go on anymore. Uh, be strengthened in the Lord. Know that you can go to Him as a refuge, a place that, that's as safe as a sanctuary. Verse 7, And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod, the ephod containing the Urim and Thummim. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. David, again, he's maturing. He's, he's becoming more and more intelligent and, and trusting in God. He's going he's gonna to seek the counsel of the Lord as to what to do. And that's something else you can do in your life. When you get to a point you just don't know what to do, ask God. He, he'll share with you. Verse 8, And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Referring to the Amalekites that, that uh, destroyed Ziklag and stole their families. Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, the Lord answered David, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. And uh, the Amalekites took away, the Lord giveth back. Verse 9. So David went, he and the six hundred men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. Now this is a little confusing. Let's go ahead and do verse 10 because it explains what verse 9 mean, meant. But David pursued he and four hundred men, for two hundred abode behind him, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook be sore. They were wore out. Uh, it's probably the older members of David's ragtag army. Uh, I mean, consider they had ridden hard for three days to get from Jezreel back to Ziklag. Uh, they probably, their provisions were probably getting low. They probably were looking forward to being home at Ziklag to refresh themselves with food. Uh, but when they got there, uh, nothing, ashes and smoke. Then they rode back uh, uh, to Besor, uh, which is oh, probably 20 miles from uh, Ziklag, and they just could not go any further is what happened. The 200 uh, stayed at Besor while 400 went on with David to pursue the Amalekites is what's going on here. Verse 11, And they, this is David and the 400, found an Egyptian in the field, and brought him to David, and gave him bread, and he did eat, and they made him drink water. They treated him well, and I think probably just by his looks they could tell that this one uh, Egyptian was in trouble. This was a, a pretty rough area. The, the, the wilderness was not the desert uh, conditions not far from here. Verse 12, And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters or cakes of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread, no food, nor drunk any water three days and three nights. They no doubt saved his life. You can go without food for a considerable period of time. Water, on the other hand, particularly in this area uh, that they're in now, very close if not in the wilderness, the desert, uh, three days is about the limit of one's life. So he had been without water and food for three days. Why? And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? Who are your people, and, and where did you come from? And whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me, because three days gone, days agone, I fell sick. Now the Amalekites were the one who destroyed Ziklag, and kidnapped their family members. In other words, this uh, Mal Amalekite that was his master recognized that he had fallen sick and basically left him to die. 
Now let me ask you, if you had a master that had left you to die in the desert, uh, how faithful would you be to him if you uh, ever came upon him again? Probably not very. Verse 14, the Egyptian continues explaining to David, we made an invasion upon the south of the Kirathites. This is a clan of the Philistines in uh, southwest Canaan. And uh, that's, the, of course, the promised land, which is southwest Judah of today. And upon the coast, or the border, which belongeth to Judah. And upon the south of Caleb. Caleb was of the tribe of Judah. And we burned Ziklag with fire. Now, David has the information that he needed. He wanted to know who it was that attacked Ziklag and kidnapped their family members. He now knows it was the Amalekites. Verse 15, And David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? C can you show me where the Amalekites are? And he, this is the Egyptian, said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. He turned over against his previous master who left him to die in the wilderness. But he's saying, You promised me that you won't kill me yourself and promise me that you won't turn me back over to my previous master because uh, if he finds out that I told he, you where they were, he would most assuredly kill me. Verse 16, And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad, the, the Amalekites. There was a bunch of them, uh, probably from horizon to horizon. Upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. They had uh, not only the, the belongings of the people of South Judah, the belongings of the Philistines, they also had David's belongings, including his two wives, Ahinoam and Abigail. Verse 17, And David smote them from the twilight, from the morning, even into the evening of the next day. God said, Pursue, and you will recover all. Uh, and that's what God meant. And there escaped not a man of them, save four hundred young men which rode upon camels and fled. All the Amalekites were killed except four hundred. Uh, camels were known to be about the fastest uh, mode of transportation available at the time. A camel at full gait can cover some territory. You might say that these 400, if you'll forgive me the pun, were humping it. Verse 19, And there was nothing lacking to them. Excuse me, I skipped 18. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. God said, pursue and you will recover all. Uh, David pursued and did recover all. And there was nothing lacking to them. In other words, they had not, his wives and the other family members had not been abused or molested. Neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them, uh, David recovered all. God said, pursue and recover all. David pursued and recovered all. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. A lot of scholars wrestle with this verse. Uh, I think it's pretty plain that that what he's talking about is not just the spoil uh, that say, the <clears throat> they took from the Amalekites, but also the spoil that the Amalekites had taken from the Philistines and the people of southern Judah. There, there was a lot of livestock and spoils of war collected, and now it was all in David's possession. 
Uh, how will they divvy it up? Let's find out. Verse 21. And David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. They were just too fatigued to accompany David and the 400. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. They, they greeted them, in other words, no doubt asking them, uh, how things went. Uh, uh, verse 22, Then answered all the wicked men, <clears throat> the men of Belial, this is the worthless or lawless men, of those that went with David, and said, Because they, the two hundred, meaning that stayed by Brook Besor, went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. And the 200 that stayed at the brook the Besor will give them their wives and their children, uh, but that's it. They don't get to share in the spoil. Now note, these men of Belial, worthless and lawless, yes, we, we realize that there were uh, some uh, unsavory characters who came to David out of Israel. Some of them probably owed large amounts of money uh, and were escaping the debt. And, uh, you know, David certainly had some lawless people in his group. But if you are a member of a group, you probably have a lawless or uh, worthless person in your group as well. Now, they may be pretty good at hiding the fact but you still have them in your group and, and be aware of it. But, and you know, it's, it's not that illogical what the, the men of Belial are saying. They're saying, hey, well, you didn't go and fight the Amalekites, we did. So you get nothing of the spoil, uh, we keep all the spoil, except you get to take your wives and your children. We'll see how this comes out in our next lecture. David's going to step in and, and make a, a decision that uh, is probably going to be an indication that he is uh, ready to take on the kingship of Israel. Got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the mark of the beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. We try to teach God's Word in a positive format. Throwing out negative about others serves no purpose by name especially. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world that's unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? Well, you sure don't need a telephone number. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
I encourage you to talk to your father. Make time each day, at least once a day, to stop what you're doing. Stop from your busy schedule, and yeah, everybody's busy, but make time for your heavenly father. Uh, he gets kind of lonely, I think, sometimes. And can you imagine if you had children and uh, they grew up and moved off and you never heard from them again? No, I mean so much as a birthday card, not so much as a happy Father's Day card. And the only time you hear from them is if they need something. Hey, Dad, I need to borrow some money. The car insurance is due and I just don't have it. Well, that, that doesn't make you very happy. It doesn't make your Heavenly Father very happy either. So uh, make sure that you make time each day. Tell Him that you love Him. Thank Him for the many blessings that He bestows upon you. Don't let the only time that He hear, hears from you be when you need something from Him. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Yeshua, Messiah, Father. We ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, uh, financial difficulties, uh, illness and family. You know, Father, if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father. Let's get to some questions. See what's on the mind of folks. Diane in Texas. Do we cause our burdens or does the Lord put burdens on us to correct us or both? It is very, very dangerous, Diane, to accuse God of putting burdens on you. I want you to take a home assignment and everyone else that feels like the Lord has ever put a burden on you. I want you to read Jeremiah chapter 23, the whole chapter. Uh, begin with chapter 1 and don't stop reading until you get to chapter 24. But you're going to learn there not to say the burden of the Lord. Because if you say that God placed a burden on you, you're going to be naming your own sentence and that burden will be on you. Uh, the Lord will uh, make sure of it. Don't say the burden of the Lord. Uh, God also tells us what he thinks uh, a great deal about false prophets in that Jeremiah chapter 23 as well. David from Georgia, I would like to ask you if Isaiah knew Jeremiah or if Isaiah died before Jeremiah became a prophet. It would help me a lot to hear your answer on TV. I will try to hear it. Uh, and yeah, okay, I hope you hear it too, David. But uh, Isaiah uh, was prophesying in a time period of 603 uh, B.C. to 588 B.C. Uh, Jeremiah, on the other hand, was prophesying from 518 B.C. through 477 B.C. So Isaiah, uh, I'm, it's not biblical, but I'm going to, uh, common sense tells you Isaiah was probably uh, passed on when Jeremiah uh, was on the scene. And then to consider where and who they were prophesying to, you asked if they had ever met uh, Isaiah was prophesying to Israel, the ten northern tribes, prior to them going into captivity to the Assyrians. Jeremiah, on the other hand, was prophesying to uh, Judah before they went into captivity uh, to the Babylonians, which was some uh, 200 years after Israel went into captivity to the Assyrians. Iris in Texas, I have a gentleman acquaintance that belongs and you name the church. I'm not going to mention it. We talk Bible somewhat and he said that some people speak in tongues while they are attending church. When these people are speaking in tongues, no one understands because they are speaking to God and the devil doesn't understand. There is an interpreter there relaying the message. He quotes 1 Corinthians to explain the speaking in tongues. I tried telling him that all that means in 1 Corinthians is that they were speaking in a different language, and you're exactly right. Can you explain 1 Corinthians, especially verse 2 and 14? 
I also need to verify we will not hear the cloven tongue until the two witnesses are in Jerusalem. Is that right? Yes, I think uh, the two witnesses uh, will have the capability of speaking that cloven tongue that uh, is the Holy Spirit speaking through them. Uh, God's election don't all speak English, I'll assure you. So I think it will be that cloven tongue. And assuredly, God's elect will be speaking that cloven tongue. And everyone understands. You don't need an interpreter such as this church. And that is not evidence of the Holy Spirit. The Acts chapter 2, verse 4 and the following verses. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is that everyone understands no matter what language they speak, that is evidence of the Holy Spirit. The word tongues uh, in most places in the New Testament and the Greek is glossé, and, and it means a language, especially one that is not naturally acquired. In other words, you, didn't, you weren't raised, let's say you're an English speaker, but you learn and you spoke English in your home. But then you had an interest in Spanish, so you took classes in Spanish, you learned to speak that, that's glossé. It's not speaking some gibberish and then having someone sit next to you and have to interpret what was said. Uh, that's, uh, uh, well, it's getting late in the game. That's, uh, uh, that's, that's speaking uh, confusion. That's, that's Babylon. Uh, it's Babel is what it is. Uh, Arnold in Tennessee, what will we be doing in heaven? Well, in Revelation uh, chapter 21 and Revelation chapter 22 is about all we're given of what it's going to be like in the eternity. I'd give you a home assignment to give to Revelation 21 and Revelation 22 a thorough read. It's going to be beautiful there. God wipes away the tears from his children. Uh, there's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. There's no more death. Uh, all of that that offends has gone in and been disposed of in the lake of fire. Brenda in Alabama, if Satan comes into you, how do you get him out? Well, you have uh, the elders uh, anoint you with the oil of our people and order Satan out in the name of Jesus Christ. If you don't have uh, elders that you can go to, anoint yourself. And uh, if you don't have anointing oil, obtain some olive oil at your grocery store, 100% virgin olive oil. Uh, obtain a little small vial. Your pharmacy can probably sell you uh, an empty little vial that you can then take a little bit of the oil, put it into the vial, and then in prayer you ask God to bless that and you promise Him that you'll use that in obedience to Him. Yes, the Word tells us how uh, that we should anoint. James chapter 5 verse 14. When you're sick, gather the elders and anoint with the oil. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people go, Christians, anointing with oil? Well, you show your ignorance. The word Christ, the name Christ in the Greek is Christos, which is the anointed one. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. In the name of Jesus Christ, you have power over all of your enemies. That includes Satan. Bowery from North Carolina. Um... My question to you is that in Genesis chapter 1, 26, it speaks of God making man, female and male. Uh, I have told my sister that there were people on earth before Adam was formed, uh, according to my understanding, you understand correctly. Would you please explain and clarify? You're absolutely right. Adam and Eve were created in Genesis chapter 2. There were people created in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And people who don't understand that have a hard time explaining uh, how in Genesis chapter 4 that Cain was booted out of the Garden of Eden and went east to the land of Nod and took a wife. 
who was Nod and who was his wife? Well, they were obviously the people who were created in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and the following verses, we refer to them as the sixth day creation. Um, and I'm going to suggest, Valerie, if you don't have the ability to share with your sister what happened in the Garden of Eden, uh, order, and if you haven't done so already, the CD set 30146. It's three CDs. It covers Genesis chapter 1 through 6. That includes uh, the creation. Uh, it goes into the three world ages extensively. It tells what exactly happened in the Garden of Eden, and there wasn't an apple tree there. It also, in chapter 6, uh, gets into the fallen angels, the sons of God, as they're called in the King James Version Bible, uh, how they left their estate and came to earth and went into the women. And there were giants, Geber, in the land after that. But if you don't understand the, what happened in the beginning of God's Word, there's no way you're ever going to understand the end or what uh, is in the middle as well. Sally in California, what does the name Eve mean in the Bible? I will be corresponding with you again soon. Love to you all and thank you so very much and love back and, and thank you. <clears throat> Sally, excuse me. The Hebrew word for the name Eve is Kava, and it means literally, if you translate it rather than transliterate it, uh, life giver. And it kind of goes along with what it states in the Bible that Eve is the mother of all living. And some people say, well, you just said that Eve and Adam weren't the first people. How could she be the mother? Well, let's bring it this way. Spiritually, she was the uh, womb through which umbilical cord to umbilical cord, Messiah would come. And on a spiritual level, without Messiah, none of us would be living. So uh, she is the life giver, uh, eternal life giver. Messiah came through Mother Eve. Victor in Georgia, please explain the day of atonement. Okay, well, Leviticus chapter 16 uh, covers the Day of Atonement. Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but because you, you can read Leviticus 16 as well as I could sit here now and read that, read it to you. <clears throat> but um, the high priest on the Day of Atonement, Aaron, and the first Day of Atonement, was to enter the Holy of Holies. Uh, one day out of the year, the Day of Atonement. It's the tenth day of the seventh month, which is Tishri on the Hebrew calendar. And the purpose, and he didn't go in by himself, he went in with the blood of a, of a goat and also an oxen to cover his own sins, the sins of his family and the sins of the people. Uh, the purpose of Day of Atonement was to uh, atone for or cover sins that had not been atoned throughout the the previous year. Uh, and then they would take two goats, uh, one representing God, one Satan. Uh, the one that was representing God they killed as a sin offering. The other one they laid the hands of the people uh, through the high priest on the goat, transferring the sins from the people onto the goat and then the goat was escorted out into the wilderness uh, never to return. Get the sin out of the camp being the message. Pauline in Arizona, should a Christian be around Christian people only? This way they can strengthen themselves in the Christian way. Or should they go to people in need or people that don't walk in the Christian way to help and show them the path? Luke chapter 5, verse 31, Jesus said, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. In other words, you shouldn't preach a salvation message to those who are already saved. Uh, I think that if you carry what you said at first too far, you run the risk that's a being Christian, be around Christian people. This way they can strengthen themselves 
in the Christian way, you run the risk of becoming holier than thou. You're too good to go in the presence of those who need for you to tell them the truth. They need you to tell them that they need to repent and, and be forgiven of their sins. If you don't go where they are, they're not going to hear that. And the problem with becoming holier than thou, you'll find in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 5, God says there that those who are holier than thou are like smoke in my nose. You ever gotten a good whiff of smoke in your nose? I know there's a lot of you in, on the western United States that probably would like to get a, a breath of something other than smoke in their nose for a period of time. We've got a lot of fires going, but it hurts when you get a big whiff of snow. It burns. It makes your eyes water. Uh, that's what God thinks of those who are holier than thou. Arlinda in Alabama, where in the Bible is the parable of the fig tree? Well, it begins in the Garden of Eden. Uh, when Adam and Eve realized that they were naked, uh, they made aprons to cover their personal parts. <coughs> Excuse me, what did they make those aprons of? Fig, fig leaves. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 24, we learned that uh, in Jerusalem there are good figs, and there are naughty or bad figs. Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, Jesus said, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. And it's critical that you understand the parable of the fig tree. Every month in our monthly newsletter on page 3, you'll find a list of suggested studies for new students. On that list, in the CD list, you'll find 30445, the CD number for parable of the fig tree. You need to understand the parable. As Jesus said, learn the parable. Didn't say maybe get around to it. Learn it. Kathy in Oregon. <clears throat> Men gave the title death angel to some being that killed all the firstborn of Egypt. What is this death angel? Well, uh, you said men say. I, I really wouldn't be too worried about what men say. Uh, I like to know what God says. And the term or phrase, the title death angel, does not appear in the King James Version Bible. Uh, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 29, we learn what the Lord said. He said, the Lord smote the firstborn of Egypt. Why did he smite the firstborn of Egypt? Because he wanted Pharaoh to let his people go, the chosen people, Israel, who had been in bondage to the Egyptians for some 400 years. D from Michigan, God said, let us make man in our image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. Who does us refer to? The angels, of course. Do you think God is alone? No, he created all things for his pleasure. That includes your soul and my soul. Have you given him any pleasure lately? Man always pictures God, Jesus, Noah, Abraham, the disciples, etc., as white, uh, meaning Caucasian. Is this proven by studies of the ancestry of these peoples in the manuscripts. Well, the very name Adam means ruddy, complected. That, that means the ability to show blood in the face. Like uh, when a Caucasian is embarrassed, uh, they show blood in the face. That's what Adam means. Do the imprisoned angels require manna to be kept Alive, Psalm 78, 25, man did eat angels' food. So uh, evidently angels require manna because that's what uh, was meant in Psalm 78, 25. God gave manna to Israel when they had nothing else to eat when they were leaving Egypt. And lastly, when God said he hated Esau before he was in his mother's womb, do you think he meant loved less. No, he did not mean love less. 
and I know what you're talking about, you're talking about in the book of Luke chapter 14, Jesus says you have to hate your mother and father if you want to follow me. If you take that back to the original languages, it means love less. Not so in this case. Malachi chapter 1 verse 3 God states there, God speaking, I hated Esau. The word Hebrew in the Hebrew language is sawne. It has one meaning and one meaning only. It's to hate. And a lot of people have a trouble understanding, well, how could God hate a, a little infant, an embryo in his mother's womb because of what he did in the first earth age? And we get a little bit of a hint of that in what uh, Esau did in the flesh. He traded his heritage for a bowl of red pottage. Um, God hated uh, Esau. He loved Jacob. Carolyn in Oregon, would you please explain in detail what the cleansing period is after being away from Christ while helping a loved one? So thankful for the Shepherd's Chapel. Thank you and the staff, and thank you for remembering the staff. Uh, Carolyn, speaking of Ezekiel, chapter 44, verse 26, where the Zadok, which are God's elect and during the millennial period, are allowed to leave the millennial temple in an effort to help one of their immediate family members, father, mother, brother, sister who hasn't married, uh, that did not take part in the first resurrection. But there's a penalty, and that is that, and why? Because they've been in contact with the dead, the spiritually dead. And there is a cleansing time. They have to be away from Christ in the temple for seven days. I'm out of time. I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. It makes your Father's Day when He looks down and He sees you reading the letter that He wrote to you, the Bible. Uh, you make His day, He will make your day. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others of our brothers and sisters who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important though, and it's this, you stay in His Word. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.